Welcome to the Watchman Channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is dollar sign watchman 1963 thank you all so much for your prayers and support god bless many of america's largest cities are in crisis crime and filthy streets are driving people and businesses out leaving cities with less and less revenue to fix their problems dale heard reports on what's known as the urban doom loop for the first time ever, the city of San Francisco is spending $6 million for a national tourism campaign, hoping to change the perception that one of the world's most beautiful destinations has turned into an urban nightmare. How bad is it? So-called poop maps and poop apps have been created over the years to help residents avoid the excrement on sidewalks and streets. And there's a lot of it. Unfortunately, San Francisco is one of only many U.S. cities flirting with what economists call the urban doom loop. As businesses and the wealthy flee urban areas, the loss of tax money means a lower quality of life, causing a death spiral as more people and businesses leave. It's also known as Detroitification. Once America's fourth largest city with almost two million people in the 1950s, crime and lawlessness caused residents and businesses in the Motor City to flee. And today the word Detroit is synonymous with urban decay and crime. James Homan is with Michigan's Mackinac Center for Public Policy. Detroit's story is one where um, there are through a lot of self-inflicted harms. I mean, Detroit had a lot of problems. It drove a lot of people away. There was financial struggle after financial struggle. They couldn't make, uh, make the numbers meet. And the answer was always to raise some more revenue from somewhere. So Detroit now has the highest property tax uh, rates in the country. While still having one of the highest murder rates and worst municipal services of any major city in the country. The specter of Detroit's decline now haunts a number of major cities. The images look the same, from Baltimore to Philadelphia to Portland to Los Angeles. Jordan McGillis is with the Manhattan Institute. So what we see in places like San Francisco uh, and Chicago and Philadelphia, um, businesses flee. Those revenues from property taxes and taxes on businesses are no longer flowing into the city coffers. Services decline and it accelerates that exodus. Made worse by liberal leaders pushing progressive policies like defunding the police. You add to that eliminating enforcement of drug laws, of allowing public camping. And with more and more people working remotely, coupled with an economic downturn, commercial real estate vacancies are growing. In San Francisco, almost one third of office space sits empty and the city's marquee mall simply stopped paying its mortgage and closed its doors. Homan says the lesson city leaders should be learning is that people want safe, clean places to live, not cities beholden to the latest progressive policies. Our democratic city governments really need to respond to residents' needs, and not on behalf of some uh, strange ideology that only a portion of their population um, holds. The question now is whether cities like San Francisco can escape the urban doom loop. This is what a nation looks like when they tell God they no longer want or need him. Since America will not recognize God as the creator of all things, follow his commandments and give him the glory that only he deserves, he has left this nation to its own destruction. Proverbs 16.6 says, In mercy and truth atonement is provided for iniquity, and by the fear of the Lord one departs from evil. There is no fear of God in America and the result is a society full of evildoers. When we are choosing to hold on to sin, rather than repent and change, God will not hear our prayers, as we read in Isaiah 115. When you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. Proverbs 28.9 says, One who turns away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer is an abomination. America continues to do evil and disregard God's moral law make up a God of our own liking, and continue to do what is right in our own eyes. 
America continues to lie, steal, blaspheme God's name, fornicate, commit adultery, look at pornography, covet what is not ours, and take human life. Jeremiah 30.12 says, For thus says the Lord, Your affliction is incurable, your wound is severe. As a nation, I think America may have reached the point in time where God will no longer hear our prayers because our sin is incurable. I am not a prophet, nor does God speak to me audibly. That being said, God speaks to me every day through His Holy Word, the Bible. If people would just open their Bibles, God would have a word for them. I believe God is warning the U.S. to turn from their wicked and unrepentant sin. The signs of Jesus' second coming are plastered all over the news. The seven-year tribulation is right around the corner, and the rapture of the church precedes the tribulation. So my question to Christ's followers is this. Are you ready? For what comes next? The Bible says in Matthew chapter 24 verse 42, Watch therefore, for you do not know the hour your Lord is coming. I want you to know, church, that Jesus Christ could come this month. Or he might come next week. Or he could even come... place and I don't want you to go there. We've been reporting on the bizarre phenomenon that seems to be taking place not just in this country, but all over the world. Getting angry at God isn't going to solve anything. Don't no, but dad me, young lady. I just said you can see that boy when we get to church. This is not the way it's supposed to be. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. So robes and positions and titles and classifications and auxiliaries and departments and works and paying your tithe and paying your dues will not save you. We are still experiencing the aftershocks of the massive earthquake that have devastated this entire region. But if you want to be raptured, you must be born again. Since all the means of Korea work here one moment and go in the next. You must be washed in the blood of the Lamb. It's over! We've all been left behind! <laughs> It's going to be joyful for those who are raptured, but it's going to be sad for those who are left behind. Life, life as we know it. Jesus said, as a sign of his coming and the end of the age, there would be an increase in deception, false Christ who will deceive many, wars and rumors of wars, nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom, famines, pestilences, earthquakes, Christian persecution, apostasy, false prophets, and lawlessness causing the love of many to grow cold. Jesus said all of these signs would come like birth pains. Jesus was likening last day's events to a woman in labor. As the labor progresses, the pains increase in both frequency and intensity until the baby finally comes. As we get closer to Jesus' return, all the signs he gave us as a sign of his coming and the end of the age will become more frequent and more intense. All of these signs are manifesting around the world in our time. We're going to begin with the deadly heat and the bad air affecting close to a third of the country's population. Unfortunately, we have been here before. Take a look at this haze in cities like Cleveland, Pittsburgh, and Buffalo. 
New York. Mm. That is smoke from wildfires in Canada. The air quality was some of the worst in the world. In Texas and beyond, the heat is the number one issue there. At least 13 people, unfortunately, have died in this weather. It was hotter in parts of Texas yesterday than 99 percent of the planet. Wow. Michelle Miller, I know that New Orleans is your city, but the good times ain't rolling this morning. It is hot. It is already 84 degrees here with a real feel of 92, and that heat index, 120. 62 million Americans are under these dangerous conditions. Uh, heat warnings, watches, and advisories. And the National Weather Service says that this weather will continue throughout this weekend, well into the 4th of July holiday. Across the South, most people have no choice but to lay low during the deadly heat wave, unless you're installing air conditioners. It's hot enough to feel the soles of my shoes hot. Undershirt, 15 minutes, it's gone. It's ridiculously hot. Air conditioning specialist Rodney Fonstock is moving as fast as he can in this heat. We're running constantly. Um, you know, we're getting calls earlier this year. 140, 170 degree attics. People have no air, they call us. The thermometer may say 99 degrees in New Orleans, but with humidity, the Big Easy is expected to feel like 115. On the other side of the state, the latest heat related death caused by 97 degree temps. In nearby Dallas, Texas, Norman Grant sums it up. It's just hot, I'm miserable. The temperature inside his home, 104 degrees before a donated air conditioner could be installed. Oh, man. Sweating like crazy. MedStar, a local emergency service, is distributing AC units provided by the United Way. That literally could be the difference between life and death. In Houston, some roads are buckling, forcing repair workers into dangerous conditions. Meanwhile, people in big cities in the Midwest also need to stay indoors as smoke returned from the ongoing Canadian wildfires. On Wednesday, Chicago, Detroit, Minneapolis and Washington, D.C. ranked among the top 10 metropolitan areas with the worst air quality in the world. So this is Detroit, Michigan. Skylines were barely visible, flights delayed and residents are being warned to stay inside and wear masks outdoors. My eyes have been watering. My throat has been sore. I've been coughing. Um, it's really a fit and I've been indoors mostly for the last three days. Take a look at Chicago, that city, the hardest hit. You can barely make out those iconic skyscrapers are there. Over the past few days, they've seen some of the worst air quality in the world. Now, officials in many places are asking the most vulnerable to stay inside. And if they have to go outside, they suggest masking up. The EPA describes those most vulnerable to be people with lung or heart disease, children and older people, as well as those who are pregnant. The smoke coming from those wildfires is still raging in Canada, where dry conditions and extreme heat continue to fuel the flames there and guys a reminder that wildfire smoke is particularly dangerous so if you are going outside make sure to keep tabs of the air quality in your area psalm 917 the wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget god what did jesus say or teach about hell hell is a fiery furnace matthew 13 41 through 42 the son of man will send out his angels and they will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and those who practice lawlessness, and will cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Hell is a place of outer darkness, sorrow, and pain. Matthew 22:13. Then the king said to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, take him away, and cast him into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Hell is eternal. Matthew 25:46. And these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Hell is a place of torment. Luke 16, 24 through 26. Then he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted and you are tormented. Hell is a place of separation. Luke 16.26 And besides all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those from there pass to us.
The Bible speaks of the reality of hell in the same terms as the reality of heaven. Revelation 20, 14 and 15. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Revelation 21, 1 and 2. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. In fact, Jesus spent more time warning people about the dangers of hell than he did in comforting them with the hope of heaven. The concept of a real, conscious, forever and ever existence in hell is just as biblical as a real, conscious, forever and ever existence in heaven. Trying to separate them is simply not possible from a biblical standpoint. The good news is, no one has to go to hell. Jesus paid the price for mankind's sin. He has provided a way to spend eternity with him and the Father. All you have to do is believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. God has already done all the work. All you must do is receive in faith the salvation God offers. Fully trust in Jesus alone as the payment for your sins. Believe in him and you will not perish. God is offering you salvation as a gift. All you have to do is accept it. Jesus is the only way of salvation. That being said, we must repent of our sins. While repentance is not a work that earns salvation, repentance unto salvation does result in works. It is impossible to truly and fully change your mind without that causing a change in action. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. Repentance, properly defined, is necessary for salvation. Near Scottsdale, Arizona, 2,500 acres of parched land are on fire. The fire line is dangerously close to homes, forcing more than a thousand people to evacuate. We raced in the house. I just grabbed a large suitcase and started checking. I knew we each needed one change of clothes, some of my favorite jewelry items, but mostly the pictures and the computer component that holds the, all the photos, right? And that's it. And we left everything else you can replace, but as long as you have your family, what more do you want? This one, named the Diamond Fire, is the ninth wildfire in just five days. And the biggest. It started Tuesday afternoon, but still none of it is contained. And temperatures topping 100 degrees are a threat to that progress. We may start to see flare-ups within the interior of the fire. Hundreds of firefighters are on the ground, and air tankers are fighting the flames from above. According to the Fire Weather and Avalanche Center, Across the West, there are 43 active wildfires. The rural Arizona community under threat is no stranger to difficulty. Because of a water shortage, they haven't had access to water since January, another symptom of climate change. The entire area is under a red flag warning due to wind gusts as high as 35 miles per hour in low humidity. As we start to warm up, as we start to get in that critical uh, fire weather time frame, we could likely start to see that fire activity increase with flames visible and smoke. The perfect recipe for disaster. A major threat to the iconic Georgia peach, the state known as the peach state because normally the crop grows great there. In fact, Georgia produces more than 130 million pounds of peaches every single year. But not this year. 90% of the state's crop has been lost. Farmers blame a warm winter, part of a changing weather pattern that seems to be here to stay. This is my great-grandfather's farm. Lawton Pearson's family farm has grown peaches for more than a century. But this year's harvest, the worst in his lifetime. You've got peaches here, and that variety has nothing. Not one? Not, not a single peach. Uh, that's the way 95% of the farm looks. His 1,500-acre peach crop, nearly a total loss. Pearson's losing an annual challenge. It's something called chill hours. His Georgia peaches, always a diva fruit, generally need 850 hours under 45 degrees Fahrenheit to blossom. This year's crop, with climate change, about 700 chill hours. And why aren't you just willing to say, okay, it's a one-off? I'm hoping I can say that. I want to say that, but we are 20% off since 2016. A warm winter plus back-to-back -back devastating frosts that killed off the early blooms. Farm-to-table Georgia peaches, this year, forget it. At Atlanta's Silver Skillet restaurant, owner Teresa Breckenridge says the cost of fresh peaches has tripled. 
I can't afford the peaches right now. And the ones that you would buy, even if you could afford them, they're just not good. We are currently living in a time Jesus refers to as the birth pains. We are fast approaching a time known as the tribulation that Jesus says will be the worst time in human history, as we read in Matthew 24, 21. For then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. We are currently witnessing events that will continue to become more frequent and more intense until God pours out his final judgments on an unbelieving and unrepentant world. One of the judgments described in the book of Revelation includes the price of food being so high and scarce that it will cost a full day's wages just to barely get enough to eat, as we read in Revelation 6, 5, and 6. When he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come and see. So I looked, and behold, a black horse, and he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not harm the oil and the wine. In this prophecy, it will cost a day's wages just for a loaf of bread. We are not in the tribulation period yet, but we are getting extremely close. Terror tunnels, rocket attacks, and the threat of invasion. That's everyday reality for Israelis living near the Lebanese border. Northern Israel and the Galilee is one of the most beautiful places on earth. It's also one of the deadliest. Residents there are under constant threat from Iranian-backed terror groups that are just over the border. Julie Stahl reports. On Passover this year, Hamas launched 36 rockets toward northern Israeli communities. While the Iron Dome defense system intercepted 25, one landed here. It was just an empty warehouse. Nothing happened, but you can see that across the street, it's a kindergarten and it's a home over here. I think this explains us in the best way, the contradiction between the beautiful day, normal life, happy children, and what could have happened if, if it was not a holiday. Sarit Zahavi lives near the border and began the Alma Research Center, an organization focused on security challenges in the region. I believe that uh, Hezbollah assisted, that Hezbollah helped Hamas to find the locations, to find where exactly to launch from. Iran backs Hezbollah, a powerful longtime enemy in Lebanon. The terror group has tens of thousands of rockets aimed across the border in order to carry out the regime's main goals, including wiping Israel off the map. This is the Israel-Lebanon border. The tower behind me belongs to Hezbollah, and they're also building the road which shows you just how close the threat is. Zahavi recently captured these photos of Hezbollah surveilling the area even closer to the border. Some 268,000 Israelis live within 12 miles of the 49-mile-long Israel-Lebanon border. About 250 of them are in Zarit, a community founded in 1967 that lies about 650 feet from Hezbollah lookouts. In general, it's good for us, quiet, relaxed, good atmosphere. Everything is green. Everything is beautiful. Born and raised here, 54-year-old Yossi Baroness heads up security and says his biggest worry is the thought of Hezbollah potentially reaching into the community. If Hezbollah would infiltrate, then I would have to deal with it. Against this, we're on high alert all the time. 52-year-old Renat Carmel says Hezbollah's advanced weaponry frightens her the most. By bombing us with new rockets and things we cannot avoid or get sheltered from them or be safe, uh, I think the next war will be more sophisticated and we don't know enough. We know a lot about their programs, about this settlement. They want to occupy us and then to kill our people or to take some refugees and then to negotiate. A nearby water tower is meant to look like the Dome of the Rock on Jerusalem's Temple Mount. There is a reason why it's decorated like the Dome of the Rock. This is exactly building the narrative that where we are standing, in their point of view, this is Palestine. In their point of view, the whole area from the Galilee to Elat, from the river to the sea, it's Palestine. So for now, Israelis living on the border continue their daily lives under this growing threat from Iran and Hezbollah, knowing at any moment they could be attacked by a brutal enemy that desires their destruction. As a sign of his coming and the end of the age, Jesus declares, and you will hear of wars and rumors of wars, See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. 
For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. The prophets of the Old Testament prophesied of these future military conflicts in Isaiah 17.1, in which Damascus, Syria will be destroyed in a single night. Jeremiah 49, the prophecy of Alam, which could infer an Israeli attack upon Iran's nuclear program. Psalm 83, in which the Muslim nations that border Israel will mount an attack on Israel in order to cut them off from being a nation. Ezekiel 38 and 39, known as the War of Gog and Magog. In this prophecy, a coalition of nations led by Russia, Iran, and Turkey will attack Israel in the last days in order to take Israel's wealth. Luke 21:25. And there will be signs in the sun, in the moon, and in the stars, and on the earth distress of nations, with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. One of the many signs we are living in the last days, right before the return of Jesus Christ, is nations will be in a state of perplexity or uncertainty over what to do in a difficult situation. This is exactly what is happening in our world today. Outrage and unrest exploding in the streets of France. Nationwide protests reached a boiling point last night after police shot and killed a teenage boy during a traffic stop in a Paris suburb. This video shows the stop and the moment a police officer aims his gun at the driver's window. As the car drives forward, the officer shoots. The car crashing just down the road 17-year-old Nael died from a bullet wound, according to a statement from the prosecutor's office, which also says the officer accused of shooting the teenager is now being held on potential manslaughter charges, though the family is pushing for charges of intentional homicide. Some of the anger may have been sparked by initial reports in French media saying the officers claimed their lives were in danger and that Nael was shot because he refused to stop. But the video circulating on the internet shows he did stop just before being shot at point-blank range. Nail's death triggered these massive protests in cities and towns across the country. Cars set on fire, bus stops destroyed, even a town hall set ablaze. Riot police responded to the disorder by spraying tear gas and arresting over 30 people. The French interior minister said two dozen police were injured in the chaos. Despite the police investigation and President Macron's comments condemning the incident, French police are already bracing for more protests in the neighborhoods that surround Paris and other major cities. French police are deploying more than 2,000 officers in preparation for what could be another violent night. Is global chaos the new normal? As anyone can plainly see, the world is in a state of decay, moral, economic, political, every way possible. People are saying the world is out of control and looking for someone, anyone, to rescue the planet. Soon, very soon, a leader will appear on the horizon that appears to have all the answers, to calm the oceans, to bring peace to all the nations. His title will be the Antichrist and he will be welcomed by millions of those on earth not taken with the rapture. Unfortunately, his true identity will be known soon to those left behind that his true intentions are death, destruction, and control. So yes, global chaos is the new normal until the Lord Jesus Christ comes at the end of the Antichrist's seven-year reign of terror and establishes true peace on earth. It seems like a good time for Satan to present the lawless one to the world. 2 Thessalonians 2, 7-12 for the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan, with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion, that they should believe the lie, that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. The signs of Jesus' soon return are so strong now, and the evidence is so clear, that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world as we know it is near. For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, that if you confess with your mouth 
the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. These are the ABCs of salvation. A. Admit that you're a sinner. B. Believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and God raised him from the dead. C. Call upon the name of the Lord, and you will be saved. Jesus paid the price for mankind's sin. He has provided a way to spend eternity with him and the Father. All you have to do is believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved. God has already done all the work. All you must do is receive, in faith, the salvation God offers. Fully trust in Jesus alone as the payment for your sins. Believe in him and you will not perish. God is offering you salvation as a gift. All you have to do is accept it. Jesus is the only way of salvation. That being said, we must repent of our sins. While repentance is not a work that earns salvation, repentance unto salvation does result in works. It is impossible to truly and fully change your mind without that causing a change in action. In the Bible, Repentance results in a change in behavior. Repentance, properly defined, is necessary for salvation. One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church. You may be at work. You may be asleep. God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God, what if his appearance occurs on a Sunday morning? My prophetic word to you this morning is get ready, get ready! Time is short. Call upon the name of Jesus today.